Coming up next on All About Android, it's me, Jason Howell, Ron Richards, and Wen Tu Dao. And you don't want to miss this one. We've got a big announcement right at the top. After that, we get into tons of really chunky news this week. My goodness, this, this episode has a lot of news to discuss. We've got Sonos, who beat Google. And now, as a result, some of your devices that you own are going to change. So look out for that. Round, we round out uh, Google's appearance at CES, virtual appearance at CES 2022, and some of the features that they rolled out there. More details about Android 13. Feels a little early, but that's where we're at right now. Motorola has an AA wireless competitor. Ron tells you all about that. More on Apple's iMessage strategy and a huge discussion around the incentives for developers who are creating apps in the email blog, plus a few more emails. All that more coming up next on All About Android. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to break into the world of IT? Get the introduction you need with IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash allaboutandroid for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code AAA30 at checkout. Hello, welcome to All About Android, episode 559, recorded on Tuesday, January 11th, 2022, your weekly source for latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards. And today is a special day. It really is. I'm very excited. 2022 is full of surprises, right, Jason? It really is. This year is full of surprises. We're starting this show off with a big surprise. We are welcoming not our guest, but our new co-host on the show, Win Tu Dao. Win, welcome to the show. Welcome to All About Android Family. I'm so excited. Hi, everybody. Your your friendly neighborhood dev is coming to stay for a little while. So that's right. It's That's so awesome. great to have you on board. Yeah, we're so exci- excited to have you here and been just like waiting to announce. And now we get to announce it. So it's just really great to have you on board. It's Every awesome. Uh, yes. Um, I told the story the first time I came on, but basically the first podcast that I ever fell in love with and got me to podcasting was Buzz Out Loud. And Jason <laughs> was the producer on that. So Join I was like, kind of think, oh, yeah, shucks. so like just... Just the full circle is really awesome. So this is, I'm really excited and thank y'all for having me on a slightly more regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're super excited. So so you're going to join Jason, me and Flo in the mix, right? right. As, as we, we talked last week as Flo is going to, you know, kind of on a, uh, on a uh, monthly schedule or so, and it's going to be great to get the, your perspective. And already we've loved having you on the show and uh, can't wait to, you know, to have you uh, talk to guests the way Jason and I talked to you when we first had you on the <laughs> I know, show. Right? So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's really, it's kind of the same thing that happened with Flo. I mean, it's just the, it's the arc of the show. Right. It's like once once a guest and then kind of moves into the position of like talking with the guests. It's got to be weird on the on the other side, you know, when when that transition happens. But ultimately what we realized we really wanted because because we you know, we've been talking with Flo for a little while about her kind of peeling back and everything and kind of thinking about the direction of the show and where we want to take it and what we can kind of do uh, if Flo is stepping back. You know, what what do we have the opportunity to do here? And we know time and time again folks who write in who you know are participating in chat people really respond well when we have not only content that uh, that has to do with the development side of Android but also when we have someone who can actually talk about this stuff from a better perspective than I know I'm capable of which is purely on the outside looking in and of course when you're you're super accomplished uh, in the world of Android development uh, as well as everything else right like someone who's who's co-hosting on a show like this really needs to kind of be care about it all and you do and so it's just really great <laughs> it worked out perfectly Aww. And Thank and you. we're just and we're just gonna gush and embarrass you as much as we can at the That's top right. of the show and tell you. So how we have no we have no <laughs> news in today's show. The, for the next hour and a half, we're just gonna talk about how awesome Wen is. Okay. okay. 
Yeah, not it's awkward all, it's at all. all the time. Right. Really? It's, it's really going to be like a this is your life win. It's going to be like we're going to start. Our, yeah. Oh, gosh. I, if, if my elementary school like teacher starts like knocking on my door, I'm just uh, well, sorry. Just, like, the I internet, gotta say, when like, we, we want to welcome a surprise guest. Oh, <laughs> love it. Love it. No, it's so, it's so great to have you here. And, and yes, definitely want to also reiterate awesome that flow still is you know able to find time for the show so you're not losing flow like flow mentioned last week she will be on yep. i think once a month is kind of her rotation and, and we'll be kind yep. of doing that on a monthly basis picking the day and everything like that so and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be fun it's going to be it's going to be fun to have all four of us together there will be times where i can't make it and flow and win yeah, and totally. jason you guys can do it or vice versa and all that sort of stuff so like it just i think it just really i'm excited about just the 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 mix and the conversations that we're going to have this year, I, I can't wait. So welcome, Win. Indeed, we probably should move on with the show, despite let's the, do it. Know, the, the, right. the shining of your shoes. <laughs> really <so. appreciate> <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Well, we will. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about this week, um, starting with some news that has to do with CES and a whole lot more. So, Burke, take us there. Hey, Jason, were there any unbreakable phones this year at CES? Oh, that's oh. a good question. If there were, there was no Burke there to stomp on them with his boots and show how breakable the unbreakable phone actually <laughs> is. Unfortunately, that would have been great. Do you have video of this? And, and okay, come on, Burke. You can stomp on that phone. You don't, little, yeah, you little can jerk. Okay, Burke's going for it. Burke's got motorcycle so boots a, on. It's a three year comprehensive guarantee. So if you were to break it, because it is possible, then we'll give you a free phone. Oh my God. <laughs> you it? You it? <laughs> the answer is what do you think? Come on, buddy. Let's uh, get it. Oh, we'll see. It's dead. <laughs> it's dead. It's <laughs> dead, Jim. Now, oh my gosh, I think he broke it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, man. That's so great. So it wasn't CI, uh, CES. It was CTIA wireless. Exactly. Right? That's a different That's conference? Right. Not yeah, even close. Okay. It was a stretch okay. just uh, squeezing this in. So. Still, I'm happy that you replayed that. But um, the question that uh, I have Victor is... Victor deserves the credit. But oh, did Victor question? find that? Yeah. Oh, perfect. He's, perfect. He writes my so, script whenever possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know this. There's nothing original coming out of your mouth. Um, but uh, the question I have is, they said in the setup there, if you break it, you get a phone. Did you get a phone? I didn't want. No, I didn't even ask. Why would I want the phone? I just broke. It's I, I, or an I unbreakable know. phone that's not unbreakable. Someone offers you a phone. Well, no, I mean, no. I was a, I was a little embarrassed for the guy. Yeah, because I, I, I would be too. Yeah. What a what a what an uncomfortable position to be in. Like, but I hey. mean, he put himself there. You know, it was True. a breakable phone. I mean, it's their company. Exactly. At least, at least you uh, were able to show that phone for all it was actually, you know, actually <laughs> worth. <laughs> anyway, it was waterproof too. At some point, <laughs> they claim. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Anyways. All right. Let's let's uh, let's talk about the news. I love that clip. Thank you for putting that in, Victor. Thank you for playing it, Burke. Um, super funny. Consumer Electronics Show. So we talked last week. I mean, I guess there were some some bits and pieces about CES. It, it was early. It was it was just getting started. There had nothing had really, really broken at that point. But this is the real fun with CES now. That has passed, I, right? I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and now it's in the rear view mirror. And uh, Google actually had a, a s whole slew of announcements timed with the Consumer Electronics Show. Um, of those announcements, broadening out support for fast pair fast pair is the function that you know if you've got a pixel buds um and i think some other headphones do this and you open the pixel buds next to your phone your phone will recognize that they haven't been paired and it'll say hey do you want to pair these to your phone it makes it really easy instead of you having to go into your bluetooth settings and start the pair and you know put your headphones into a certain mode that can be kind of painful fast pair makes it easy well google has announced that they're bringing fast pair to a whole bunch of other device types like chromebooks uh, windows pcs i think through an app uh, google tv android tv and matter compatible smart home devices you're still going to need headphones that actually support fast pair so that's you know pixel buds Jabra elite threes just as a few examples um but that pairing process will be a lot faster so 
yeah, it's not revolutionary news, but uh, it's still nice. I know it's convenient, uh, no doubt. When I've used it on a phone, it's really nice uh, when it does that. Um, Windows PCs are going to be getting nearby share. This is kind of tied into this, you know, similar functionality. I think it uses, you know, kind of, uh, it, it's also using the Bluetooth protocol in order to do, do this, but uh, you'll be able to share share files from your Android device to your Windows PC in a nearby share sort of way, the way that you can do it through two different Android devices. And I don't know about you guys, I don't ever use nearby share. When do you ever use nearby share? Is this a, like a, a, a function that, that ever finds a way in your life uh, to get yeah. used? Nope. Nope. And um, I've been on projects where we added it. Like I think when nearby first came out, a couple of the products I was on uh, added it because, oh, maybe it'd be cool to find like a fellow. Yeah, no, we removed it. Like pretty much most projects I've been on, they kind of either have just fallen by the wayside and got hidden or just were completely removed. So I have no idea. Um, so like, when, yeah. When you choose to re remove it, um, is that because you've like literally you're not, you're you're finding through your own metrics that like no one's even activating yeah. mm -hmm. or using that feature at all? Yeah. It's like why support it? Yeah, that's usually it. And usually things like this, especially things where you're talking to another piece of hardware to another bit, another customer because of maybe like bugs from like you know the fact that hardware talking to each other is actually inherently hard or like security or just something changes. Um, it's like it's not like nothing. It's not like once you you know, implement something, that's it, you're done forever. There's always going to be upkeep. And if like two people are using it and it costs like us, like two people's development time to like fix it and keep it up to date, then yeah, that it's, it's, it is mostly metrics. Um, like, I, I guess it, if we kind of have like something very specific or if we feel like it's not going to be like a maintenance cost, which rarely that's the case. Um, usually it's not really like a let it fly and, and kind of go off into the horizon. It's never really like that um, metrics. It's all about the numbers, unfortunately, for, for things yeah. like this. Well, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, if you have the data that backs it up that says, hey, look, if all of our users, you know, 0.05% uh, of them have ever used this feature. And like, you know, like you illustrate, that's actually a really great way to visualize it. If you got two people using it and two people maintaining that, you know, using using their work hours in order to maintain that feature, like it absolutely makes zero sense to keep it in there. So, yeah. Um, but you know, Google's broadening support. So who knows? Maybe we haven't. Some, maybe like you gotta, like QR. You, oh, sorry. You, you have to assume so, like like QR codes. You got to assume somebody's using it. Yeah, totally. Right. Totally. Like like why would they expend the resources and the time to add it if no one is using it? I, I know I don't use my phone and my Android device with files. Like like the way like my, yeah. my, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm alone with here. Files or something. Yeah, yeah the way totally. yeah the, like Same. I don't store documents on my phone. Like my phone is at best a triage device, and if I need to review a document on my phone, it's transitory. It's quickly a look and then move to the computer. Like I've never been in a spot where I have the important presentation on my phone and I need to nearby share it to the computer. Like no, like that's not how it works. But yeah. So maybe maybe totally. somebody does. So I'm actually kind of interested in this. Like, so um, for people that follow me, I post too many videos of like workouts. Like, I, I just like making videos. That's kind of one of my things. And like, I, I lately to kind of keep in practice, I've like recorded like some workouts or like when I do a dance class, I record the routine, but I edit on my Windows machine. So I actually think mm -hmm. that's kind of an interesting workflow for content creators where you might not want to necessarily edit, edit a video on your phone. If you're maybe doing something a little bit longer form, or you want to kind of do something fancy or add some jitters to it with After Effects or whatever, but you really don't want to edit on the phone. Then now you can kind of go out there, use our kind of like brilliant cameras and, vid and kind of video taking devices that we have now in our phones and be able to kind of very quickly go home and like do your TikTok, Instagram, the other things the kids are doing kind of thing and go viral. And things. <laughs> I, I think actually that's kind of an interesting use case. And I probably will be using that because right now I'm like uploading to photos and then Download right, like, right. Well, that's Dropbox, that, and then export. that's the point I was I was just going to make. Yeah. Like Burke in our behind in, in our behind the scenes chat just said, you know that he you know he emails files to himself, <laughs> which then made I'm me totally realize guilty. that 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 not only not only that, but I I slack things to myself. Like I'll, right. I'll be on the desktop and I'll pull a document into Slack and get on my phone and pull it down or vice versa. So maybe we should be using nearby share. <laughs> know, right. It's a good, <laughs> it's a really good point. Cause I'm totally guilty of doing those things yeah, too. And I'm like, there's totally, gotta be a better yeah. way. Oh wait, there is, it's nearby share. But we're just, uh, we're being snarky and making fun of it. So like, yes, cool. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Real cool. Uh, and let's make fun of this. Android automotive is getting YouTube. <laughs> that's something to make fun of. Although... Thankfully, it only works while parked. 
somebody's yelling at us right now being like, not thankfully, that makes it pointless. But, you know, for safety reasons, like it's good that, you know, that you can't put a big YouTube video on your on your in dash screen while you're driving. Right. Um, they're saying like, if you're waiting somewhere, waiting for someone, you can use that, fill that time by watching a YouTube video, you know, something like that. Uh, getting more control over your car. So your assistant can do things, uh, it more integrated with the car. Like, you know, for example, the, the example that I read was warming up your car with a command from inside, which would actually be really nice. I would love that. If my car was capable of doing that, I would totally use that. Use that all I got to admit, I got to admit that it's not Android auto, but like my, my car has an app that I can start the car from inside the house, yeah. which is, which is a, 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 an amazing, like remote start, which isn't new to cars and stuff like that. No. But on, on these 18 degree, uh, mm -hmm. days here in New York, uh, uh, yeah. it is, it is very handy to warm the car up for, for 10 minutes before I even go outside. So yeah. That's Heck nice. yeah. I wish I had that. Of course, my it's not I know. degrees uh, outside, but still. I was gonna say on those on those sixty degree days in California. <laughs> oh, please! Hey, yeah. it's been getting to freezing the last you know few weeks. It's been like thirty two overnight. Eighteen degrees. So. I'm literally checking right now. It is eighteen degrees outside right now. <laughs> There's the different shades of cold, but cold is cold. <laughs> at least it's not that cold here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not sub zero. <laughs> Tell me, I'm sure someone out there is emailing us right now. You think that's yeah, sure. cold? I live in uh, I live in Antarctica. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Welcome to our listeners in Antarctica. Um, automatic Bluetooth audio switching between devices. So if you're wearing headphones and you're like watching a movie on your tablet or your phone, and then you receive a call on your well, on another device. So you're watching a movie on your tablet and a call comes through on your phone. There would be an automatic switching uh, capability so that the audio would instantly transmit over to the phone so you could take the call. And when the call is done, boom, back to the tablet, get the audio fed through. So that's kind of neat. Uh, and then finally, and I think this is actually really cool and surprised that it hasn't been so far, but Wear OS is going to be able to unlock Chromebooks and phones or tablets when the wearable is unlocked itself and near the device. So if you're wearing a watch and it's unlocked and it's on you, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's an extension of smart connect, which I kind of thought that already existed between the watch and the phone, but I guess it didn't because I read the story, but I mean, I have thought about like, why can't this unlock my pixel book? And, uh, apparently that's, that's in the works. So that's Google at CES making some announcements. It's, al it's almost like a CES themed feature drop for everyone. <laughs> you know, a bunch of, bunch of random little bits, but some cool stuff in there. Yeah. I like it. It's, it's fascinating that they feel the need to do something at CES. I mean, like this has been a couple of years now, even before the pandemic, remember they had the booth with the experience with the roller coaster and all that oh, sort right. of stuff, you know, like, like, like that Google is prioritizing CES. I find very interesting. So, Yeah. I guess, I guess being present in all the different points, right? All the different opportunities and CES is just another opportunity to say, oh, by the way, we have more cool stuff. Right. Yeah. But cool. can you believe it when Android 13 apparently right around the corner? Yeah. So I feel like we just started talking, we were just finished talking about Android 12 and Android 13 still a little bit ways away, but we do have some idea yeah. of what might be in it. Uh, what's new is, what's old is new again, what's new is new. And some things just get a little bit of polish uh, as kind of has been like a theme re recently. So Android 13 is going to make QR code scanning a little bit easier for you. Um, it looks like <laughs> in the next uh, release of Android, we're going to get uh, a couple of different ways of quick accessing or shortcuts to your QR QR scanner rather than having to open up the camera app and then hope that it reads the QR code. It looks like we're going to have at least a quick settings tile, which is really awesome, uh, kind of in the same vein as like your flashlight or, you know, do not disturb mode uh, being, being accessible from the notification drawer. And it also looks like we're going to get some kind of QR shortcut from the lock screen. Uh, although it seems like we're not quite sure what it might look like yet. Maybe it's like hitting the power button. Maybe it's just kind of a lock screen element. 
And whether that kind of just opens up the kind of lock screen, like the camera app, like uh, like immediately or, or what's that going to look, we don't know yet. But it seems like QR codes have finally come into their own. I told my oh, husband about QR this and he's code. really excited. I know, like I, I kind of remember when I first got into conferences was kind of when you could like create your own QR code with like your name <laughs> and like your contact information and you generate that and you like take it with you. And some people like had it on business cards. So and it kind of became like, you know, a novelty and that kind of thing. But now- yeah with us not really wanting to touch things or have like kind of objects around with information when things could just be, totally. you know, more environmentally friendly, more hygienic by just being a QR code. Uh, Google saying, all right, we'll make it a little easier for you. My husband's really yeah, excited. The, um, the, yeah. The pan, I, if I did not have a, my bingo card, the, the winner of the pandemic would be QR codes, <laughs> right? but, but, but here, but here we are. And it's fascinating because it's like, I honestly, in, in my various day jobs, QR codes are coming up more and more every day. Um, we're using them for various different things in different places and different spots. Actually, like with Scorbit, we have a way where you can print out a QR code for the pinball machine and just scan it with the app uh, to tell them tell the app that you're playing that game. Like, the, like it, it, oh, it's okay. everyone has a phone. The QR codes, it just works. So the technology just actually works. And I I thought of it recently because I was watching. Oh, I was watching Apple TV Plus on my Google uh, Google TV Chromecast, which I still find hysterical. <laughs> but but um, I needed to. It logged me out. I needed to re-log in, and the login f feature was to scan a. Q was it Apple TV Plus or was it? I might have been logging into Samsung to the art store for the frame. Anyway, I was doing something on the TV, but the login thing was scan this QR code, and then it sent me to a web page on my phone that I logged in on the phone, and then it told the TV I was logged in. Right. So like it, it's becoming ubiquitous. And I, I got to be honest, the more I use QR codes, the more annoying it is to use the camera and have to line it up just the right way and then get the very, very tiny pill with the link to open it up. Right. Like I'm, if I'm it shocked recognizes that, it at all. I feel like yeah. I've had so many yeah. opportunities to use the, Q, the camera to scan a QR code and I shine it on yep. it and I shine it on it and nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, well, it's not recognizing it for some reason. Am I doing yeah. something wrong? You know, it's like questioning it. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. good to see yeah. who knew that QR codes would be our friends. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I mean, hey. you know, like apparently they've been big in Japan, which I'm sorry, I use that phrase, but apparently they have been. And I think it's just. It was just like time, right? It was just time. It, yes. it, it's kind of like <laughs> other things in here. Like even talk about like nearby, uh, the nearby share and even things like sort of like Android Auto where, yeah, like they, Google releases these things early. They don't kind of quite get pickup, but then they stick around, they stick around. They like make maybe the implementations better. They make it easier to develop. They, it just, it, or it just becomes time. Like necessity is the mother of invention. Maybe like just necessity is the mother of adoption in this case as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, right. I mean, it really was in, in many ways, you know, the right kind of technology uh, for the time right now where people yeah. don't want to be touching or, you know, I haven't wanted to touch things for the last couple of years. It's a, a great right. kind of no contact way to do that. So well, yeah. clearly 2022 is the year of the QR code. So yeah, just get yeah. ready. So totally. It's the tw 2022 is the year of the t tablets and the QR code. There it is. And the metaverse. <laughs> It'll be metaverse and QR code. And the metaverse. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh God. I was in a meeting this week about metaverse. Oh, no. um, Lucky um, you. Yeah. Oh, God. You don't even know what I saw. Um, <laughs> all right. We'll move it on. Uh, it's oh, not the we, year. We have it's, a little bit more. We have a little bit more. Oh, oh, do we have a little more? Oh, we do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry about that. My bad. So just wrapping up with a little more polish from Android 13, uh, something that came around that came from Android 10, but is continuing to get some polish is the output picker. Uh, this is where you can kind of see kind of like any devices that you can output uh, media to. It's just getting a fresh coat of paint, uh, kind of aligning a little bit more with some of the big UI changes we saw in Android 12. And something that's uh, really new, 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 new is the tap to transfer feature uh, for moving media playback between devices, which I'm really excited about. Uh, yeah. You know, if Me yeah, too. like if, if you're kind of like us, like we are a little overly connected. We have a Nest Hub on our kitchen counter. We have, you know, like a Google or sorry, Chromecast enabled t like TV on every floor. And, you know, we like don't try, we try not to stay in one place. So having to, you know, kind of manually disconnect and reconnect between all these these different media playback devices is kind of annoying and kind of in the vein of making things better, faster, less frictiony uh, Android 13 may 
have a tap to transfer feature where it seems like you can just very easily move playback between your different devices without having to disconnect and restart the whole process again. So yeah, it looks like some polish coming to Android 13, we hope. And nice. it looks like it is going to have what is a chip notification. If you notice in Android 12, when you're on a call and you see kind of up in the status area, a little chip letting you know that you're on a call or that your camera's on, et cetera, et cetera. Looks like it might, it might take the form of a chip notification that lets you kind of easily switch things back and forth, but we'll see. So it's too soon to say for sure yet, but hopefully nice. some good Teflon, Teflon, frictionless, like smoothing of our yeah. Android experiences. Teflon. Teflon. Which you, I mean, which you have to imagine with Android 12 being the big visual refresh, you know, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of like major visual change in Android 13. It probably is going to be exactly that kind of like a smoothening out of, of what was begun with Android 12. But I think a tap to transfer feature, like I'm trying to think how often I would use it or when I would use it, but that seems like a really useful feature. If I had two devices, just be like, yeah, take this thing that's playing on my phone right now, boop and play it there, you know, and have it just transfer without me having to like open up an interface and like, you know, point on a, on a selector and say, yes, play it on this device. Any way that we can kind of make our devices kind of talk to each other in, in very intentional ways. I'm all for it. So yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, but now it might get a little more complicated though, at least with those, uh, speaker <laughs> <Yes>. devices. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. So I felt like my feed blew up the, uh, it was yesterday in fact. Yeah. Because, um, as we, as we all may know, Google and Sonos has been in a trade court battle. Um, and Sonos just won. Um, and the ruling that was handed down was that Google infringed on Sonos's pat patents. Um, and these are patents related to Google's casting capabilities and how it handles multi-room audio. So oh. there you go. It's directly tied to what we're just talking about. Um, yep. from, the New, from the New York Times, the Sonos claimed that Google got a, uh, got a look at how their system worked back in 2013 when the company was pitching to integrate with Google Play Music. And it believes Google, quote, blatantly and knowingly copied Sonos when it made the Google Home Speaker. Um, oh. And this lo this lawsuit's been going on for for over two years, and the result is that Google can't import its own products uh, manufactured overseas that infringe on those patents. Um, so this includes the Google Home, Nest speakers, Pixel devices, and Chromecast devices. Um, Google says it's been developing its own alternative technology since the lawsuit was originally brought. And so what this means for you, if you have one of those devices, functionally, it means that speaker groups won't be volume controlled together anymore. You'll have to be done on a per speaker basis. So if you have a, you know, you know, I have all my Google homes linked as, you know, all speakers and I can have the same thing playing on one and have the same volume. No longer you have to adjust the volume individually on each device, <sighs> which also seems annoying, but I, I know we don't like Louis C.K. anymore, but the the the, the old Louis C.K. joke about the person complaining about the internet internet not working in a plane. It's like, yeah, right. On, you're, you're, like, you're like, like we have these speakers that stream music. Yes, you have to adjust the volume individually. It'll be fine. You know, like let's 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 but, see the forest for the trees. But still, very it's first like, world problems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. but at the, at the same time, if you've got two Nest audio speakers, right, that's, that's like yeah. the step down from the Google, uh, the, the what was it, the the high, highest end Google Home speaker, I can't remember what, what they called it, but the really yeah. nice speakers, they can be, well, I, I think all Google Home and Nest audio speakers can do this, but you can set them up as a stereo pair, right? Now, what I wonder yeah. is... If I have a stereo pair, like, you know, this is my left, this is my right, and they're coming into my app, will I really have to adjust the left and the right individually from each other? And yeah. if so, please, dear God, make that an easy, like, thing to, like, I could just, I just think that's going to be really annoying. As an audiophile, yeah. that's super annoying to not have them linked and unified. It's just, yeah. That's, yeah. I, I realize it's maybe a first world problem, but it's also kind of dumb because like I've never seen a stereo that, you know, that you have both speakers controlled individually. Or, and if you do, there's some way to unite the, the controls so that they travel together because who wants yeah. the left speaker to be 70% and the right speaker to be 40%? Like that always yeah. just sounds weird. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. Um, also, quick props to Fl Fl uh, to Florence I and to Flo for writing the article on Gizmodo uh, that we referenced in this story. So good job, Flo. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it, it shows the value of patents. And Sonos was there first, yeah. developed the technology, got the patent, and yeah. defended it. You know, and like and Google. You know, this is honestly this is a David and Goliath story, and Google lost. So yeah, it's yeah. Fascinating. Uh, I mean. 
it's, I, you know, I, it, yeah. yeah, go for it. Wayne. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just, I, I feel like, um, especially, so my background, I actually started off thinking I was gonna be a hardware person. I am being a software person. So I think that, okay. So I am all happy for like kind of a smaller company to not get pushed around by a bigger company. I think um, I'll speak for myself on this, that um, I have a lot of issues with the way that patents are used for software in particular. Um, I remember being very pissed off kind of back in the day when, you know, Apple could patent a rectangular device with rounded corners. And of course there was a big case with Google versus Oracle recently and kind of, you know, I, I guess it's kind of easy to rail on the trademark slash copyright slash patent system in this country and that it's kind of overreaching. It, there's plenty of, you know, uh, I forgot what the term is for companies that just, you know, buy up, you know, these trademarks and patents just to sue people with tra- uh, patent trolls. Patent um, trolls, yeah. Patent trolls, yeah. And so I, I, I'm all for small companies not getting pushed around, but I, I also feel like w- this is one of those things where like, like, like you were saying, Jason, it's kind of obvious. It, it seems like, cause like the whole thing with like patents and trademarks is to, is to protect ideas that are not obvious, right? And to protect mm-hmm. like kind of novel things. And if you ask me, having, have, if, if you just take the idea that you can, you know, broadcast music via Bluetooth or whatever to, from one device to some speakers, and you have more of them, it seems like an obvious idea that you'd want them to be the same volume. So... Yeah. I, I, I don't I, I don't want to like you know demonize Sonos for having these patents at all. I just feel like it's it's it always kind of feels a little bit funny when you know and and not necessarily that we're just first world complaining, but that there is something a little bit odd about things that seem very obvious and that we as consumers just kind of have to like oh why can't I change my Chromecast <laughs> like why can't I change my like connected device volume like easily in a way that seems kind of obvious. I don't know. I this totally. sorry and it's kind of just is one of those like hot button things where just like ah oh, like why is it like this like yeah yeah Sonos, but also I, why. <laughs> I felt a, a similar way about the uh, the feature that I think that was definitely on iPhone first, which was like, it, it, you know, if you got a message with a phone number, it would recognize that it's a phone number and it would make it a hyperlink that you could then tap and, and call. And I realized somebody had to do that first, right? Like Apple, from my understanding, Apple designed that recognition first and said, hey, we should make it easier for someone to call that or to email that that address or whatever. But when you really think about the concept, like it seems so obvious, right? And maybe it only seems obvious now because we have it. And I guess that's mm-hmm. probably the question. But yeah. um, why why would I not want to be able to quickly call the, the phone number that was just texted to me? And so to not be able to have that in an OS because Apple did it first and patented it like it kind of feels very similar to that i think you i think your point is absolutely spot on yeah we'll see i mean maybe there's something about the way that google implemented the volume change that maybe it's not the fact that it's a like a group volume change but rather a a way that they implemented it that that matches the way sonos presented Mm -hmm. to them as doing it and they'll come up with their own system that still does it but does it differently in some way shape or form and maybe we won't even see well like we won't even see as users exactly how that's done because the change is behind the scenes i don't i don't know how that's going to work out no no i think that's a real valid point though in that again um i think traditionally when i think of patent patents like especially like kind of growing up in kind of engineering school um like patents of often, like I, I always think of a patent as like something that protects a process, that protects something physical, something like kind of novel, like the way that you're doing something is faster, better, different than anyone else has done it. And I, I know that's probably just my personal perspective on what patents are, but I, and I think that's very valid. Like if Sonos has a very interesting way of like architecting something that is not obvious, but that gives you, you know, like, like lightning fast connection, or if they're able to make it super reliable because the way that they implement it and the way that they structure something is not obvious. Yeah. That is worthy of that. That's for sure. So it, it is a spectrum. I feel like, yeah, rounded, rounded, rounded corners is on this end of the spectrum. And then, you know, how to efficiently like, and like maybe like securely, I don't know, like synchronize volumes, like you now without, like with only Bluetooth or with, with only Wi-Fi. like it's, it's, it's a spectrum. And I think it's fair. I'm not, I'm not saying like, it's not a totally like invalid patent or, or not. It's just, it's right. uh, it's, it's a yeah. weird spectrum. It's always going to be disagreements on what is valid and what is not. Totally. Yep. No question. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. Well, that's the news. And well, that's the top news anyways. We've got hardware coming up, but uh, let's take a break and thank the sponsor of this episode. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Uh, if you're tuning into this show, tuning in 
on, on the, the tune in dial. Uh, you may have more than a passing interest in technology and specifically in IT, but it's new to you and you're not sure where to get started, perhaps. Well, now you don't have to worry about where to start because we're, we're going to tell you where to go. That's IT Pro TV. Go straight there. IT Pro TV has the knowledge and certificates that you need to break into the IT world while being desirable to future employers. This is how you get your IT job right here. January's theme at IT Pro TV is all about getting started in IT. So you're going to have a great start to the new year. Uh, there's a free weekend uh, coming up. It's uh, January 15th and 16th. It's the end of this week, actually. So if you just want to dip your toes into IT, you can check out the following free courses. CompTIA ITF Plus and CompTIA A Plus will be a course that you can check out. Linux Essentials. Uh, Microsoft 365 Fundamentals, that's MS900. There's going to be a hands-on PC build from the bench. That sounds super interesting. Uh, Cisco CCT Routing and Switching, that's 100 490. And Apple Certified Support Professional uh, Mac OS 11, that's ACSP Mac OS 11. Uh, just a ton of free, excellent content that you can check out this weekend. That's January 15th and 16th for free. And if you're worried about, uh, you know, that maybe learning IT can be boring, well, IT Pro TV is anything but. They have enthusiastic edutainers that actually make learning IT interesting, uh, entertaining, even fun, because they enjoy it. And that, that enjoyment comes through in how uh, they present it. If you prefer shorter formats, courses are in 20 to 30 minute increments, just the right length. Uh, if you haven't have had a short attention span, or maybe you have a tight schedule, this is going to fit in perfectly. They have seven studios and film Monday through Friday. They have the most up-to-date content with every vendor and skill. And their courses go from the studio to the course library in just 24 hours. So super quick turnaround. Uh, they make sure that you're prepared for your exams with their virtual labs and practice tests. So it's not just content that you're watching. You're also engaging with that content. IT Pro TV has uh, wonderful monthly webinars on January 13th. That's just a few days from now. That's Thursday. Uh, they're going to be discussing cloud computing confidential, the secrets to leveraging the cloud in your organization. Uh, just tons of awesome stuff. You know, they've, they've got the, the live streams. They've got the, the, uh, the virtual labs and the practice tests. They've got the webinars. If you're looking to break into the world of IT, get the introduction you need with IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash allaboutandroid. You'll get an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions. And that's for the lifetime of your active subscription. You just want to make sure that you use the code AAA30. That's itpro.tv slash allaboutandroid. Make sure and use that code. I just said AAA30. You'll get an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. They're doing awesome stuff over there. So check it out. itpro.tv uh, slash allaboutandroid. All right. And with that, it's time to jump into some hardware news. Let's do it. See, normally Ron would get this one because it's, it's, it's funky, uh, funky stuff. But there's another one in hardware that Ron would also get. So true. I can't have them and, all. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> and Wynn has the foldables experience. So go for it, Wynn. <laughs> all right. Well, you got to share, Ron, because, uh, you know, you sure. got to share I'll sometimes. Share. So I'll that's share. fine. That's I'll fine. Share. <laughs> so <laughs> we already know that Samsung has been kind of doing gangbusters in the large screen folded devices with our folds and our flips. And I think quite a few of us are folders and flippers uh, on this on this podcast. Um, well, at CES 2022, we've got a they've got a couple more form factors for us that uh, that are pretty interesting. So I, I guess I'll try to describe it as best I can for the podcast only folks. But what I think is interesting about these four uh, Samsung kind of pro uh, concept prototypes is that kind of, if you like, think, for example, of uh, the uh, Fold, where it has like two screens, like the front screen and then kind of the middle screen, this kind of, uh, some of these concepts kind of try to move away from that. So the first one is the, uh, fold S, uh, an S because it actually <gasps> kind of folds in and out in an S shape. So if you oh. think kind of like a, maybe like a pamphlet. 
So rather than having, say, a screen on the front and then a separate kind of like fold out screen kind of like within, this is all just one screen. And the way that this the S Fold so works cool. yeah, is just like a pamphlet so that when it's folded, the first third or, or what, what have you becomes the front panel uh, of as opposed to having a separate screen. So that's the S, the Flex S. There's also the Flex G. Uh, which kind of, if you think more like maybe, I don't know, like a menu at a fancy restaurant where the content is inside and then you have kind of like the two sides of the device kind of folding inwards one over the other. Um, this is a little bit different. You can actually have your large screen, but have the screen more protected from scratches, bumps, and bruises, and drops. There is also the Flex, what was it? Flex, flex Slide, which I was really excited about. I think uh, there was like we were were you all talking about like the droid the the OG droid last uh, last yeah. week yeah yeah um, and this is kind of maybe like gave me a little bit of flex or a droid uh, droid slide or a droid the droid uh, old droid Android phone vibes where um, you kind of have a little bit of a extra bit sliding out but really it actually I think it was kind of hard for me to see the video it actually looks like rather than having a screen that folds, which, you know, if you're kind of someone who has a fold, like a the, the current fold three, there's kind of some crease in going on. You know, you can kind of see where yeah, like the two right. halves of the screen fold out. This looks to me more like a kind of almost like, um, if you think of like a conveyor belt or maybe like the the tracks on a tank, the way that they kind of roll out like that or a bicycle chain, yeah, it yeah. seems that the screen is rolling up and kind of staying like kind of in a more circular roll and then being able to be expanded out uh, as you slide it out. So there's, there's going to be no crease hopefully. Uh, and then finally, just like with the galaxy note, making, making things bigger and better. There's also the flex note, which is basically taking something like a flip or kind of the other that are kind of like mono screens that kind of fold in and just taking it to laptop sized um, form factors. So which is crazy, yeah. which is like, it's like, it's <laughs> like the is. surface, it's like the surface duo, but bigger. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a laptop, it's a laptop with, instead of a keyboard, it's a display. Like that's crazy. Or it's like a foldable iPad pro. Yeah. I, I think like actually this, the, the flex S is, is pretty amazing actually. Like the, oh, just I, the technology. Yeah. I got to tell you all of these take foldable yeah. to like the next level and like Bravo Samsung. Because like, here we are looking at like all the stuff we've seen of foldables. I mean, like, I feel like we said 2021 was like a breakthrough year for foldables where like Samsung finally shipped affordable foldable phones that people wanted, right? These are like next gen stuff. And let me tell you, everyone listening to the show, if you're listening to an audio podcast right now, that's great. When you get on your computer, go look on your phone, find the video version of this of this episode and watch the videos that Burke is rolling as we're talking about them so you can see these demos or go find the demos online. You have to see these to believe them. And I just and this is why I love foldables because they're so bananas, right? Like this full like this 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 flex note is enormous. Like and but then you got to wonder what is the cost going to be on this? Oh right? my goodness. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the flex note is actually cooler than a very large, um, what, what was the surface duo? Because the surface duo was actually two screens with a hinge in the middle. It wasn't a full, like a single screen that, that takes the entire space. Right. And this is exactly that, but laptop size. So that's, that's even, even uh, cooler. And I should also point out TCL. We've talked about TCL in the past and very recently, you know, back in December, they were showing off some of their concepts, which a lot of them are very similar to what Samsung's showing here, which just goes to show that this is this is R and D that's happening, and you know, not just with one company. Like, oh, let's see what kind of cool, you know, interesting, weird things that we can do to push the push the envelope. They're all working in a similar direction here, which means you know, the very large laptop that folds and it's a single screen. Like, we're probably going to see that at some point. That would be my guess. I mean, I don't know that for certain, but um, if they're all kind. Kind of working in that direction the rollable you know we we saw the, the kind of scroll i think now we've we've talked on this show about three different manufacturers that are testing concepts there so someone's going to bring that to market um yeah. so yeah these things will end up going from a curiosity and a you know a, 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 a pushing the boundary sort of device into hey we've got a product and you can actually buy it now and uh, it'll be curious i'll be curious to see which one kind of wins out if, if one does you know I love this stuff. I love this stuff so much. And I love that <laughs> Samsung is not the only people doing it. 
<laughs> uh, yeah. There's the uh, the oppo. Like I, I guess, and I think it's kind of. I, I love the idea that they're playing with what will work for people. So yeah. you know, like I I think the Galaxy the, the Fold S is very fascinating just because of that kind of really interesting idea of like it's the same screen but like kind of in different form factors. But then yeah, the G seems very practical. Like if you're if you're kind of someone who is commuting a lot or telecommuting a lot and you need your large screen device but you worry about a very ex- what is likely a very expensive device getting damaged, then you can kind of kind of uh, prioritize protection. And, right. you know, for, and, and like, I'm kind of curious to see whether honestly, it'll just be like roll, uh, rollable, rollable foldables, roll foldable, roll foldables, roll, rollable, yeah. rollable, yeah. Foldable. Ro- foldable, ruffle, rolls. rolling, r- ruffle, rolling on the ruffle floor, fold it, ruffle, ruffles, Ruffables don't have ridges or don't have creases. There we go. <laughs> Ruffables don't have there creases. You go. <laughs> wow, there you go. When you're getting right to like just giving marketing uh, tips. Yes. You do this all the time. And yeah. so you're, you're fitting right in. This is excellent. Yeah. yeah. That's like, but it, it'll be interesting if, if maybe that is what the thing is. Because I, I think I've talked to a couple other dev friends that have the fold. And yeah, the crease, I, I guess your mileage might vary on whether you start to like uh, your care brain starts it. to kind of paint over it and whether that's yeah. what people care about. So, but yeah, just seeing all these different like varieties and flavors and seeing what wins out. I think this is, you know, where we're getting to, we've, we've got like over the hump of, okay, foldables can be a thing. People will buy them. Yeah. Yep. Now right. it's like, okay, what specifically are, are people going to buy in the future? Or is it going to be like phones today where we have like three or four different ones and whether you're an enterprise user, a telecommuter, whether you're just someone at home, like maybe you'll have just your pick of how you want to fold it. Yeah. yeah, love it. It's a it's a cool direction for everything to go, and it's gonna keep uh, gonna keep Ron happy. I think sounds like it's gonna keep you happy too. When <laughs> oh, so cool, so so cool. But love there's it. more, right? There's not. It's not just that, right? We have uh, some something else, right? With the uh, TCLs. Well, the op- well, no, I I just put that in. That that was just more along my my kind of yeah. point that I made. You know that they're all working that direction. That that's actually yeah. oldish oldish news. That was from December. Yeah. That TCL was showing off their own um, wow, kind of so concepts cool. as well. But yeah, they're all kind of moving in that the, direction. Cool stuff. I love this stuff. The crazier, the better. I want crazy <laughs> phones. Um, but anyway, um, so it's it's I, I, on to our next story. We've seen in software like an independent developer or like scrappy folks come up with an idea and we've seen like Google go, oh, that's cool. We're going to put that in the next version of, of uh, Android, right? We've seen that happen yeah. all the time, right? Um, sure. uh, we don't often see it in hardware though, but it seems to be happening. Um, you might remember last year uh, I, I, I purchased off Indiegogo and, and, and did my review of the AA Wireless, which is a wireless adapter for Android Auto for, car, you know, for cars. Um, so you don't need to have your phone plugged in in order to access, activate uh, Android Auto. Um, well, Motorola is getting in on the game. Um, they actually have developed their own hardware to si- solve wireless connectivity for Android Auto. It's called the Motorola MA1, and it sells for $90. And it's basically like a black puck design that actually looks a lot like a Chromecast uh, dongle. Um, but it plugs in and gives you wireless connectivity uh, for your phone and your car. Um, and it's available January 28th. Um, I did not predict Motorola coming up with one of these little devices because uh, it really feels like a hobbyist kind of niche kind of thing, but maybe Motorola sees a, maybe not. they see the success, they see the success that AA wireless and some of their, uh, it feels like there were all of a sudden there was a bunch of these on the market, uh, in the marketplace. Like there was two or three options that came out after a wireless and now Motorola is out there for 90 bucks and probably they have the supply chain and the distribution. Like you could see this being sold in Best Buy. So yeah, totally. I mean, the design on this, you know, is, is way different, uh, looking than the yeah. AA wireless, which, Kind of well, I'm tr- I'm trying to pull up the AA wireless. I know I saw like a, yeah, it's a, the AA wireless is a little squarer. Kind of has a little bit of a more generic look. The Motorola one definitely has more stylized, kind of like sleek, compact sort of yep. design to it. You are the one that has this uh, has the AA wireless in your car and you use it, Bert, uh, uh, Ron. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. I almost called you Burke. Uh, maybe Burke has it too. I don't know. Uh, but Ron, would you consider? No, he doesn't. There we go. Uh, would you consider getting Motorola? It's like, is there any reason that you would you would consider getting Motorola over um, AA Wireless? Anything that Motorola could include that AA Wireless doesn't do? You'd be like, you know what? That makes it worth it. No, because it just. Wor- I mean, like, what is it offering other than just the wireless connection? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, mean if one the, thing it could could do is is multi-user. I know that multi-user was a yeah. challenge 
on a wireless and i don't i don't even know that they, you know this they haven't mentioned anything in motorola's um marketing that this solves yeah, that but but but, uh, but i also don't but that's not a problem for me i mean yeah, maybe the, indu- the, the, the yeah. industrial design of motorola's is a little nicer but like a wireless cost me 85 bucks mm-hmm. and so motorola like why is motorola's five dollars more right <laughs> like i don't know like functionality wise it's it, functionality wise it is a very simple device yeah. plug it in make a wireless connection maybe the app and like the way it all works could be a little more smooth but like once i got a wireless working i haven't had a problem with it since so yeah, i don't see don't i don't see really a need, need to replace to touch it. it yeah yeah, yeah. so interesting that's just me motorola sees the market there apparently sure yeah well yeah because there's a bunch of people don't know a wireless exists right so, well that's true I, I, right so, yeah. you really got to know yeah. You and know. A lot yeah. of people are seeing this for the first yeah. time going, oh, I've wanted to do that. I had this is yeah. great. We can finally do that. It's like, well, you could. It's just yeah. it was a yeah. it was an Indiegogo. It wasn't a Motorola yeah. product. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then finally, well, we kind of talked about this a little bit last week, but I realized, you know, thanks to an email, we didn't really talk much about the phone itself and the specs and everything. But we talked a little bit about OnePlus 10 Pro, about, you know, they were they were dribbling out some, they were doing kind of like a, a drip tease of the uh, new phone, as OnePlus does with their marketing. Uh, well, it's official now. Uh, we have all the information and they've made the announcement 6.7 inch OLED 120 Hertz refresh. And of course that's a dynamic refresh. So it depends on the content on the screen where that lands. It's got a Snapdragon eight gen one. That's the most up-to-date current, uh, Snapdragon processor. This could be one of the first phones with that processor. I'm not entirely certain on that, but I think we're kind of at that stage where this is probably, if it's not the first, it's definitely one of the first. Uh, also a Snapdragon X65 modem inside. This supports up to 10 gigabits per second uh, speeds. If you're lucky to find, you know, uh, mobile internet that offers speeds of, <laughs> of you know, that fast. Um, similar to last year's uh, OnePlus 9 Pro, it has a 12 gig LPDDR5 RAM. It has 256 gigs of UFS uh, 3.1 storage. Um, also happens to have last year's rear camera setup, which is the Hasselblad uh, kind of triple camera setup. I think it's a triple camera setup anyways. Uh, but the front camera is upgraded. So it was 16 megapixels. Now it's a 32 megapixel selfie camera. Uh, but they also added in some, uh, and you can see there kind of a really cool kind of like different, uh, style of design, kind of like the camera bump is like bleeding over the edge and looking out and we've seen Samsung do this a little bit with their phones recently. Um, but they've, they've added in, um, some interesting, as far as the cameras are concerned, some new software features, the camera can shoot in 12 bit raw plus. So if you you know want to get that super like pristine uh, photo capability, at least as pristine as the cameras will allow you to, uh, that's one way to do it. Also has a new movie mode, which basically brings pro controls into uh, video, like ISO, shutter, white balance. You can adjust all these on the fly while you're recording, which is nice. Um, 5,000 milliamp hour battery, 80 watts wired charging. 80 watts is going to charge your device from zero to full in 32 minutes. So basically a half an hour and you're good to go. And uh, like we said last week, releasing first in China on the 13th. So that's this Thursday in a couple of days. They didn't name a price, so we don't have a price on this, but I'm guessing, you know, this is this is their pro series. It's probably gonna be similar to, to everything before, which I wanna say off the top of my head is somewhere in the 800 to $900 price range. That's what I like, total guess. Um, but they are re- they are releasing first in China, and they say a global release will happen later in the year. So, you know, I, I I have to imagine this is supply chain stuff, and releasing in China allows them to kind of have their release be close to where the supply actually is. You know, that's again, that's just a guess. But uh, OnePlus 10 Pro, if you like OnePlus, there's your big upgrade coming soon or in a couple of days if you're in China, but definitely going to have to wait if you're not. So, um, interest, excited, meh. How do you guys feel? Interest. (laughs) Interest. Interest. Yeah. I'm interest. Yeah. I I am interest. Oh, 
I, I'm no, interested. No, no. I, I like, so I've kind of been watching a lot of like, um, I guess, so kind of in like me trying to attempt to be like a content creator and like do YouTube stuff. I kind of watched a lot of like, you know, oh, here's your recommended gear. And something that is kind of just really common and obvious right now is like, hey, your phone can be your camera. And so something totally. like the one 110 Pro, which has like the nice hassle bad name, which is kind of like, you know, a nice, you know, fun, well-known name and like kind of like photography and videography and also being able to do 10 bit raw. I, I like this a lot. Was it, I feel like it was like, was it like Xiaomi or someone else last year? And, and obviously like um, Apple and, and the iPhones have kind of touted this idea of you can film movies on your phone now. And I think this aligns very well with that, especially, you know, especially now when everything is, is kind of like ad hoc, like ad hoc at home, TikTok, yeah. YouTube, all the things. I, I really like this. I really like this a lot. It, it feels, it feels cool. And I, there's so much that you can do with those kind of specs. I'm kind of interested how, like how much storage you have because at 10 bit raw, that, that feels like you're right. going to just like, you're just going to fill up that phone real fast. Maybe you Blast need that nearby it, share. Probably. You need that yeah. nearby share. There you Maybe go. We'll Tying it back. Tying it back around. <laughs> nice. It might take like <laughs> half an hour to transfer, maybe to pay your network, depending. But I, I, I don't know. I, I really like it. It feels, I, I like that. I, I like that. I might pick one up. I, I think it looks cool. And I like the idea that it could be just really uh, a very like video. I, I don't think it, that's what they're intending, but I like that idea. I, when you said 10 bit, I'm like, ooh, 10 bit? Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, so, and Lynch. your current phone, I'm trying to remember, is it the Z Fold 3? Is that is that your phone right now? That's my I'm work phone. I have a 6, six, 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 the 6 Pro. Wait, the Pixel okay. 6 Pro as my, my, my personal daily driver. Okay. So, H Have yeah. you had a OnePlus phone as your as your daily driver in the past? I have not. My husband has. So just sorry. Yeah. My husband is like an Android developer and like yeah. I saw, we used to use his device. I used to abduct his device for testing back in the day, kind of around like the one, the first one plus and the one plus two time was the mm -hmm. second one plus time. And I think we always liked the phone. I think we really had, um, really were very positive on the company. I just haven't bought one in a while. Cause I feel like, especially being an Android dev, I tend to, because all I hear about is like Google stuff all the time. I tend to get very fixated on pixels. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and a secondary Samsung, because, you know, again, the second kind of like the, the largest like uh, OEM for Android, but you know, OnePlus has always been super interesting. And I think a really good uh, alternative to, you know, the other big two to three uh, OEMs. So excited. Yeah, indeed. I was pulling yeah. up the one plus two, remembering the design, uh, you know, it just, I, I had forgotten what it, what it looked like. I have the one plus one somewhere. I think it's actually at work in my, in my own kind of hall of fame uh, display in my office, uh, which I, I think the one plus one was a pretty classic phone. Um, yeah, they've, they've put out some really great hardware and, uh, you know, I, I think last week we were kind of holding them to, I don't know that we were holding them to task. We were just reflecting on the fact that like the, the kind of uh, the novelty around OnePlus has kind of faded a little bit, and as they've as they've moved more into mainstream um, into the mainstream market, some of what some of the magic that OnePlus has had is has kind of faded a little bit. But that doesn't mean they're not producing good phones. Um, I thought the OnePlus Nine Pro was actually a pretty solid phone, and I'm sure the OnePlus Ten Pro will be too. It's just not as much of an enthusiast brand as it used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, that's kind of by design, I think that's kind of what they're going for, right? They really, they, I'm, I'm sure the folks at OnePlus would love for that company to be another Samsung, to be have to have that reach. Yeah. What ma phone manufacturer wouldn't want that? That means success, right. you know. Right, and it, it boils down to shareholder or investor happiness, right? Which is mm -hmm. which is reaching as many users and customers as possible, right? Like that is yep. the goal. Like like very like this. No, I mean, don't get me wrong. You might see some zealot, not zealot, but some sort of you know like inspired tech luminary who's like, we're making it for the right reasons and for design and to make something elegant. It's not for everyone, but at the end of the day, it comes down to who's writing the checks, and you got to make them happy, and you make them happy with profits right and that means yep. sales so yep. no one can get around that especially in the hardware game at all so true very yeah. fair super true yep. super true i mean it's, it's and that's the harsh truth of technology fueled by capitalism 
unfortunately. <laughs> Very much I so. can't believe I can't believe I'm so anti-capitalism <laughs> as I'm getting older. It's like it's so crazy. <laughs> but it, but it really it really I mean, and we're going to talk about it in the next in the next block. But it really stifles yeah. innovation and it becomes, uh, you know, it, it becomes consumer hostile. So, yeah. 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 Well, then. That's that's quite a tease ahead. Up next, we're going to check out some apps and we are going to talk about uh, one example of what Ron is setting up. That's next in apps. So I got to tell you, if if I see this GD Wall Street Journal article about teens dreading the green text bubble one more time. If another person sends it to me or it came up in my feed nonstop or honestly, like there's a, you know, tantamount of World War Three going on in the uh, WhatsApp <laughs> chat with my in-laws where I'm one of two Android users is myself. And then my wife's aunt also has an Android phone and everyone else is on iOS. And I moved yeah. everybody to WhatsApp so we can all be on the same thing. And my wife's cousin has been railing on, since seeing this article. And it just, it's, uh, it's fascinating, but it drives me crazy. But basically, you know, the, the net net of it is the Wall Street Journal did this really, really good piece diving into the the psychology that is driving teens to want iPhones because they don't want to be ostracized as the green text bubble in a group chat. And, mm. you know, and while I, you know, I, I don't have teenagers yet, I have three year olds, so I'm not there yet. Um, I've heard, and Jason, I don't know if you heard about this with your oldest as of yet, or if she's, if she's, you know, still too young, I hope so. But I've heard from my sister who has, you know, uh, teenage girls that like the chat politics on their phones is like real. And like, and if you're not politics. on iOS, you're, yeah. you're not cool. And like all this nonsense. And what's great about the, what's interesting about the Wall Street Journal article is what I found was that they dove into some of the stuff that came out once again from the Epic Games lawsuit with Apple. Um, in discovery, uh, it came out that, uh, several emails, I'm going to read these for, you know, kind of, you know, verbatim. So we hear how to say, but, uh, Craig Federighi, Apple's chief software, uh, executive in 2013 wrote in absence of a strategy to become the primary messaging service for the bulk of cell phone users. I'm concerned that iMessage on Android would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families, giving their kids Android phones. Um, and then uh, three years later in 2016, Phil, Schill Phil Schiller, who is the uh, marketing chief of Apple at the time, uh, emailed Tim Cook and, and another email said, moving iMessage to Android will hurt us more than help us. Um, and uh, another app, former Ac Apple executive sent an email, iMessage amounts to serious lock-in. So Apple knows damn well what they're doing here. And what the what the what the motivation is here, and the and the the sad sick thing is that it worked, and it's working, and it's just so disturbing. Um, and yeah, if, for our video watchers, you can see the the graph that's in there in terms of the the skew and ages. Um, between Apple phones, um, basically, you know, skyrocketing amongst, you know, younger 18 to 24 and probably even, even younger than 18 now, um, which is also ridiculous considering how much they cost. Um, and it, you know, that adoption rate is just ridiculous. And a, a lot of it is driven by, you know, there's a whole section of the wall street journal article. That's the, the subhead is never date a green texter, right. Which is just like uh, unbelievable. Um, and what I thought was interesting coming out of it, coming out of that article, of course, you know, Hiroshi Lockheimer, friend of the show, uh, chimed in uh, and, and had a series of tweets and, and kind of talked about it and basically made the, the point blank statement, which I fully support, which I applaud Hiroshi here. He says, we're not asking Apple to make iMessage available on Android. We're asking Apple to support the industry standard for modern messaging RCS in iMessage, just as they support the older SMS MMS standards. Um, and he says, why is that important? Because phone number based messaging is the fallback that we all know will work. And he's absolutely right. And there's a long thread that he did on January 10th that I encourage everybody to go read uh, on Twitter that he wrote about it. But here, Apple in to support their sales and their profits to benefit their shareholders have created something that that drives lock in and then has created a segregation of level that is negatively affecting our children period like that's what's happened like that you we are training our children to ostracize someone who is different than them yeah that's true it's a really good point i yeah. you know i i do have young kids um but Second they are not 
they are not of they're not encountering this yet. Yeah, I great. mean, you know, neither of them have phones, right? Like I have one daughter who's almost nine and one daughter who's almost 12. Neither of them have phones. Our plan, our plan has been that they don't really get phones until they're in like the ninth grade and they're fine with it and we're fine with it. Um, and, but I don't know, I don't know what this turns out to be because I think more and more of their friends are starting to get phones. Um, you know, my daughters call their tablets iPads, but they're not iPads. They're Android tablets, but like, they don't know the difference. They don't, they don't really care about the difference. They do the thing, you know, they, they just think of iPad as like a tablet. So maybe this will crop up at some point, but I think, um, there was a, uh, Max Weinbach, also a friend of the show, uh, did a video that Hiroshi kind of linked to in one of his, in, in one of his, uh, you know, tweets in the tweet storm. <clears throat> Where he basically points out, like, this is a, I mean, this is basically, this is Apple making a decision to draw the line, be, you know, and, and not allow for a new standard to become yeah. ubiquitous, essentially. It, it's essentially Apple saying, we are going to make uh, the quality of life for not just Android users, but also iOS users lower because of that lock-in perspective, right? iMessage is a differentiator, or at least it was. But now we have yeah. RCS, which RCS mimics, you know, slash, you know, basically does most of what iMessage does as well. It just happens to be a replacement for SMS or an upgrade to SMS. And for everyone else, that's what it is, except for Apple. And the, re the reason yep. is because, you know, Apple's not going to bring value. that in. Shareholder mm -hmm. value, right? Like they have that yeah. lock in, and uh, that's, yeah. that's just crummy. Yeah, it's 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 super unfortunate. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's just it's. It, <laughs> it, 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 I, I mean, I could rant and I mean, like I could rant about it. I mean, I know we've spent years ranting about RCS and ranting about messaging and all this sort of stuff. But like this, like reading this Wall Street Journal article and and seeing this and seeing it in play in my own family and friends and stuff like that. You know, like I've got social friends who 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 be like, oh, green bubble. You know, like that sort of thing. And it's just like right. it, it, I I find it completely sickening, completely sickening. So yeah, it's just it's. Yeah, stupid it's the Apple. system. The system, you know, is is designed in such a way that yeah, yeah, it's, it's easy to interpret that and and yeah. um, uh, yeah, that's just I think that's that's by design and yep. unfortunately, um, I don't know. I like at a <clears throat> at a certain point, is Apple compelled to support a standard? Right? This I, I don't know. I don't know if at a certain point, if everybody else is is not using SMS but is using RCS because it is the next SMS, but, except Apple is, you know, is not supporting it. Like, are, but this, this, know, this is probably an Apple, nothing this to is keep an, them to do that. This, this is an Apple's DNA though. Any of us, all of us have read and watched and done and absorbed everything we can about the history of technology, right? And what was the, the origin of Apple, thanks to Steve Jobs, was a closed architecture. Right mm -hmm. at the time oh, yeah. of uh, at the time of, of interoperability and standards and like you know slot design card slot designs and things like that that would work across different things. He said no, it's only going to work for us. That you know, may, you know, I can't tell you the years I spent. I spent my teen years working in a computer repair store and like the expense that was spent on the stupid tool to actually open a Mac. Those original uh, rectangle Macs, you couldn't open it with a regular screwdriver. You had to spend hundreds of dollars to get this dumb tool to do it, right? Like the, the limiting yeah. factor that Apple went to at that point in time. And then even now, not only RCS, but it's going on with Thunderbolt and USB-C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. It's the, sa no, it's the so same. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I can't tell you the number of times I've tried to stop myself from cursing on the show right now, but it's the same crap. <laughs> It's the same playbook. And yeah. you would think that you would think that given so much of Apple's success when Steve Jobs returned was on the back of universal standards like USB, like MP3, like, you know what I mean? Like all this stuff, yeah. like everything that Apple is, is, is successful for now was built on the shoulders of a shared, you know, kind of a standard that went across. And then they brought the iPhone and closed the app store and did this iMessage crap and like created this, this thing again. And they've done a very good job from a marketing standpoint by making something super tangible and super um, uh, wanted 
or lusted after, right? I mean, it's genius. As some as someone who works in marketing and 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 has business experience, like I give them tons of respect for the campaigns and all that sort of stuff that they've done. But they've also now, for the past fifteen years, brainwashed millions of people and have created what is tantamount to society, like encouraging discrimination in society, which I, we, which we know for a fact is not along Steve Jobs ideals and like, or, or all the, like all the stuff, you know, everyone should have a computer education, all this sort of stuff. And yet you create a world where literally people are ostracizing because of the color of their texts. Right. I feel like yeah. it's a Star Trek episode. Like it's the, it's the black and white Star Trek episode all over again. It's like, yeah. it's crazy. Or black mirror yeah, so, episode. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. It and, the and the fact, episode. and the fact that the fact that so, and I'm sorry, I'm ranting uh, here, but the fact that so many people in, in, in our society, amongst our friends, amongst our family, whatever, laugh it off and go along with it is even more sickening. Like not seeing that, like that's what, that's what's really disappointing. Like I straight up called my cousin a bully. I'm like, I can't believe you're bullying your aunt into having to change her phone because you don't like her chat bubble color. Like it's unbelievable. Right. So, right. I don't know. It's, it's really I mean, dangerous. I, I've actually personally, and like, don't I, you know, I, I totally agree with everything you said wrong. And I mean, like, and if you just, if y'all want like a data point, I personally have like, it's not even just teens. It's even just like grown people. I've like, yeah. I, my husband and I were literally sitting at a restaurant and overheard one person bully, like more or less bullying their like lunch mate over the fact that they had an Android phone and they had an iOS. And of yeah. course, like there wasn't a discussion. It was just like, he was bullying her. Like I, and there was no discussion about pluses and cons. Just like, no, it sucks. It, it, that was literally what he said. And even me as an Android dev, I wouldn't say I've gotten bullied, but I've definitely had people tell me to my face, oh, well, Android sucks or something, or iOS is better, like to my face, knowing that's what I do for a living. Or even just like when I it wasn't even part of the conversation, I'd be like at classes and, you know, sometimes we pull out our phones to like, you know, record people and things like that. I, I would have people just like, oh, I, I, they all, oh, I'm an Android dev. This is like what I do, like kind of explaining, oh, you know, I almost feel like I have to apologize for having an Android phone. Like, right, like and, and right. that's something I, I shouldn't have to do, but it is definitely a feeling where, I'm the one person in Android phone and, and like, yeah, I've, I've, I felt pressure to say, oh, it's because I'm an Android dev. I'm sorry, which is absolutely <clears throat> BS, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, the social pressure is real and it's there. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think we're making anything up. I don't think we're, um, you know, uh, overblowing anything. It's, it's real. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I yeah. Anyway, preach. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it really is sad because it like reminds me of, the crap I get. I have a debit card uh, th with the with the Mets logo on it because I'm a Mets fan. And like here on Long Island, I'll take it out at the supermarket and someone behind me will be like, oh, no wonder it's taking so long. It's a Mets fan, you know, like and it's the, the tribalism and the 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 inherent, um, you know, like pitting us against each other for things we believe in or ways we look or things like that within our within human nature that scares the crap out of me because this is like I know and I know that it's 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 hyperbolic but it's tantamount to racism you know like that that's this is now I understand how racist exists in the world because they think so justified in their belief that their color is right and it just it, it makes me right. want to vomit it just oh right. yeah so, and yeah. and actually has yeah real real world consequences you know outside yeah. of just it hurt my feelings you know yeah yeah, yeah for sure yeah so. yeah preach Ron good yep. stuff that is what we had for apps because really we didn't need anything else uh, I think that was, that was that was well done sir I need I need a nap now so. <laughs> you can nap in a second uh, coming up next we're gonna check out some email uh, that's up next. Triple A at twit.tv, 347 show AAA. Ron, you don't get to nap yet because you got the first email. No. <laughs> Hopefully this will this will this will give me some more faith in humanity. Um, right. so Christoph, Christopher writes in and says, I recently got a quest two, and while listening to your recent conversation about the Hall of Fame, I realized it'd be awesome if some developer made the Android Hall of Fame into a VR experience. Having assorted devices that can be held and looked at in 3D or put on literal pedestals would make me actually get the feel for the devices I haven't seen in person. Luckily, I have a few good and bad phones, including the HEC One M7 with a purple damaged camera, the Nexus 6P with a bad battery problem, the Pixel 2 XL, and a 2015 Shield TV. And my wife had the Nexus 5X that died of a bad USB port and a, a Moto X4 that died of a boot loop. 
I'm wondering if anyone has had a VR phone museum idea. Also, do you know of any good APKs that would sideload well on the Quest? <laughs> so, so far, I've had little success with standard Android apps. I like that you just slid that one right in. Well, yeah, Christopher, yeah. I love also. I love your idea of a virtual um, uh, a virtual Android Hall of Fame. That would be awesome. That would um, be so cool. I love that idea. It'd be very cool because then you can compare yeah. the sizes, look at them, stuff like that. I thought, as I was reading this, I thought you were going to suggest cardboard get put into the Android Hall of Fame because that probably <laughs> to this date was like the best VR, you know, like low cost VR experience at Android. And I would, I would, I would posit that cardboard does deserve at least an exhibit about that experiment. But, um, uh, this is so cool. So if someone's a VR developer out there and wants to make it, uh, get in touch. We'll love to work with you to do it. Um, I don't have a quest. I, I haven't played VR that much, so I don't know of any good APKs that sideload onto it. Yeah, but, uh, I do have so. a Quest. I have not loaded any APKs on my on my Quest. Yeah. I just I, I don't even think to do that with that you headset. Can't to be yet. honest, they um, they sort of locked down the OS, especially. Oh, did they? I thought with I, the more updates. I mean, there are oh, a couple okay. things, but I not, remember hearing about it, but yeah, I never tried it. It's, it's not it's not ready yet. Yeah. Huh. I, I I mean I kind of I don't know how I personally would need an Android app in in VR space like just it's not an application that or you know this is yeah. not something that really makes a whole lot of sense to my use case which is not to say that there isn't I just haven't thought Wait a minute what is this and I don't know I just I just literally just googled sideload whatever but there's uh SideQuest is an Android app that can sideload VR games Yeah 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 there there I'm are like ways so to much. Yeah, yeah, there are ways to to uh, sideload. Uh, yeah. Yes, SideQuest it does exactly that. My, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding what he was saying when he said APKs. Is he talking about bringing Android apps into VR? Got it. And I that, that I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. SideQuest is a way. It's it's and like they, an they alternative. Refer to those as 2D apps, like when yeah. you're not it, right. Yeah. 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 Right. But yes, yeah, SideQuest exists. I've actually not tried that out. I keep meaning to do it because there's some really cool development happening there uh, where yeah. they're inter. They're making apps that are integrating with the hand tracking. Uh, and to you don't have to sideload. Do some um, really cool stuff. You don't have to sideload it anymore. You no. kind of had to install it separately, and now it's actually uh, it's a it's separate all integrated. store. But you can actually get to the apps without having to do a lot of hoopla like you did previously. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so I need to check that out. And you know what? This is all relevant because the Oculus Quest is running on Android. So just saying. It's not like we've uh, went off on a, on too much of a tangent, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a do? You, have you checked out the VR when? Like, are you is, are you at all in on that game at all? You know, I I used to really like, and I and yes, Ron, I love the cardboard. I I kind of love any kind of low tech tech low low like low resource like innovative tech that kind of brings yeah. things to more people, like VR. I I get motion sick real bad. Real bad, yeah. real bad. So I, I, t I tend to stay away from it. I love it. I, I love it as a technology. I love like the kind of like the promise of VR, especially for things like say education, um, especially in kind of these kind of times where it's kind of hard to go out and see like people in real things. So I'm always like positive on it, but personally I'm not. Also, I've had some very bar embarrassing experiences with uh, keep talking and no one explodes with a VR headset. I made people... <laughs> It, it was amazing. It, I made people laugh unintentionally, yeah. but you know, so I, I'm all for it. Um, and I, I, yeah, definitely I'm still on the cardboard. And I think that's about my level of like immersion that my body can yeah. handle. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I understand. I understand. It can get a little queasy to me sometimes too, but I just think yeah. it's all so cool. I, I've kind of forced my way through it and get beyond it. The more I've done it, the easier it gets for, for me to kind of stomach <laughs> in certain ways. So <laughs> it's taken some time. Anyways, thank you for uh, writing in, Christopher. We also have an email from Nick who says, I had my Pixel 6 on the wireless stand and was on a conference call with a colleague. I suddenly heard my phone ring. Firstly, I thought it was someone phoning me as I had not initiated a call, but then the call was answered and a voicemail started to talk. For some reason, my phone had called some restaurant in Queens, New York odd as I'm actually in London, UK. Having checked my assistant log, I can see that it somehow recognized the phrase call with and somehow interpreted this to then call a restaurant in the US. 
<laughs> Surely it should not do that. I did not even mention the restaurant to call. So how did it randomly call this restaurant? As you can see from my assistant log, and he included a screenshot, uh, there seems to be a lot of attempts at understanding my conversation. I think there is a feature on the phone that says assistant is on when on the stand and the phone is locked. So I need to look at the setting and stop this from happening. Any thoughts on the best setup here for Google Assistant to stop this happening when on the Pixel stand? You know, I could have swore that there was a way to deactivate Assistant when it's docked on the Pixel stand. I could not find that method. Um, I thought there was a feature. I searched it online. I searched it in my settings. Alas, I came up empty. I even went as far as to disable Assistant on lock screen, that setting, because I was like, well, when I dock it, it's on a lock screen. It gives me that little Assistant bubble down at the bottom telling me that it's like listening. Um, maybe if I disable Assistant on lock screen, it won't do that. But sure enough, once I docked it, it still did it. So uh, apparently not, unless you know somebody out there actually knows. And if you do uh, AAA at twit.tv, let us know. But um, I don't know. I feel like you should be able to do that because at least someone out there is going to want to never use Assistant and that would keep them from buying the Pixel stand. But um, maybe, maybe so. Maybe, maybe it's just like if you're getting the Pixel stand, you're all in on Assistant. We don't care. And that seems to be the case right now. So I don't know that I have a really good solution for you, Nick. Unfortunately, I tried. I came up empty. Um, and I don't think that this necessarily has, has to do with the calling 911 thing that they're probably almost certainly completely unrelated, but I have definitely, and I'm sure you two have as well, uh, seen some really interesting, you know, commands being registered through assistant when I had absolutely nothing of the sort and, you know, coming out of my mouth, like I never said call with, but it happened anyways. And it interpreted something totally randomly and something weird happened happens with the system. I'm sure you guys have experienced that. Yeah. I'm not alone. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like just a fact of assistant. So unfortunately, but there you go, Nick. I hope that's helpful in some way. <laughs> I mean, it's not helpful, but it's helpful to at least know that it's not possible. That's my guess. All right. And, uh, in, in honor of your first full-time episode, <laughs> when you get the honors of this next block. Oh gosh. I got the email of the week. That's exciting. Um, all right. <laughs> and I, I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like a, <laughs> so um, a little bit of method acting here, I suppose, but okay, let's, 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 let's jump into it. Let's jump into the email of the week. Uh, let's see here. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. 35 years, system programmer and game developer. I believe in supporting the software I use. I am sick for flipping subscriptions. Charge what you want for the software, period. Then charge for an update if you need to and allow me, the user, to decide if it's worth it or I want to move along to another software package. Subscriptions are annoying. Subscriptions are tedious to keep up with. And it's not just a matter of just one cup of coffee or a movie when you have 10 plus apps and they are all wanting from $4 to $10 a month subscription. Then Adobe has their subscriptions and then Microsoft has the subscriptions. Stop with the subscriptions. Ron doesn't even talk about paying for more than a year every month for software that never gets updates or gets pathetic updates or something just disappeared without notice because the OS has passed it up. And in fact, the package has been abandoned for a long time. The guy has just been taking your money. Just stop with the support your dev, just set a price for the software and charge that. If your software costs too much to support after you sold it, Ron, then you aren't charging enough. And if it won't sell for what you have to charge, then maybe you need to develop something else. Brett. Uh. <laughs> Thank well, you. Why Brad. am I getting singled out here in the email of the week? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> it's all about you, Ron. It's all about know, you, Ron. I, yeah, this this has to do with a conversation that we had last week, and I'm trying. Yeah. You know, I, I I'm sure you had some some arguments about it uh, that apparently Brett has has latched onto, but the point that Brett is making is there's too many dang subscriptions. I, I think I think one point that I pull out of here that I think is is definitely worth worth considering, worth discussing, is the idea that if an app is worth something, charge what it's worth 
don't put it on, on a recurring subscription basis as a like as a developer i guess how how does that sit with you because i know there are reasons that that a subscription makes sense right there's costs mm -hmm. recurring costs that have to be covered um but there are also probably developers i'm sure there are developers that have a subscription when there aren't those recurring costs so I, what do you think about that one i mean this I have many feelings about this. So I, I do understand, Brett, I, I do understand like your the frustration with subscriptions. Subscriptions can be consumer unfriendly, they can be overpriced. And yes, there are some devs that are not so great and they give slow or missing updates or just leave you with bugs and still charge you. I, I, I'm very sympathetic to all that. The question of how much someone's time is worth is a complicated one. And it it, it it's what we're talking about, basically. How much do you think someone's time is worth? And right. I... <sighs> It, it, it is so, you know, like I, where do I start with this? I, yeah. It's the question of how much is your time worth? And I think yep. for a large company that might be an easier question to answer. That might be an easier question to be able to find easy answers for. If you're talking for smaller shops, if you're talking to an individual person, how do you ask them what their time is worth? Do you say, okay, I work 50, you know, I, I maybe I'll charge, like say, I think a good rate is $50 an hour. How many hours did I spend on this? And, you know, that's, that's kind of like a nice mechanical mathematical way of doing it. But there's so many things that I think, especially when you start out in dev that you don't realize um, you need that costs will incur, that things happen. And mm. You're, you're, and, and like, and like another thing is like, it's, it's hard. So yeah. I, I, if you, if I made you an app today, I, I, and I took me say, let's say it took me six months to do it. Um, and I, I guess, okay. So maybe I make something like, I don't know, uh, flashlight app. Just, no, I'm just flashlight app. There you go. Flashlight app. <laughs> QR code reader, QR code reader. QR code reader. <laughs> there we go. And, and it takes me like, you know, and it takes me, say, a couple of months to do it right. Let's do QR code reader because I feel like QR code reader. It takes me like two months to get it right. And I could try to like add up the number of hours that I spent working on it and divide by some number. That's not a guarantee that you're going to get that number of people. Like for one thing, you know, we're in 10, 12, however many years of mobile space. There are a million apps that do probably, like it used to be fun to, as an app developer, think of what your million dollar app idea is. In 2022, we're in now. Someone's probably already thought of it, and yeah. so and a lot of someone's have have and already. A lot of someone's have yeah. thought about it, and a lot of someone's are either just putting out apps for free because they're just trying to exercise skills, or maybe promote something else. They maybe have ads um, as as a way of like drawing money, and you know, there's a lot of different like um, kind of strategies around apps. Do you just roll an app every three minutes, regardless of whether yep. the user wants it or not, which I really dislike, or do you like offer in that sense, a, pre a, a, a premium experience where they can pay to get rid of ads, or do you just not have ads and have a subscription? And when you are putting your, when you're putting an app out there to make money, to make, to monetize, you're competing. So not just with other apps, their quality, their particular implementation or perspective on what you're doing, you're also competing on how other people monetize. And so, yes, I feel like maybe I spent two months on my QR code app and maybe like for what I feel I put into it. And if I expect, say, if I hope, if I hope like a thousand people download my app, do I, what, what do I charge to make up for like the two months of my time? Do I charge them $2 and make 2000 bucks? Do I charge them like maybe $10,000 and get whatever the math on that is and kind of like make, you know, more of a living on that? I'm sorry, the math is doesn't adding up. So it, it, it's not just, it, it's, it's a very hard equation. There's no winning there. And yeah, like the problem with charging once and then saying, you know, charging more for updates later is many fold. So on the Google play store, for example, um, you can you can charge or you can make your app free. If you decide to change at any point, you cannot you, you can't change your free app to a paid app later. It basically becomes a new app, and that becomes a yep. problem of well, it's a different app, so your metrics are going to be different. Your marketing might be different. You know, like all, all these kind of yeah. like things that are attached to that old app become invalidated. And once you charge for an app, you can certainly raise the price, but the people that have already paid it paid for that app have yep. paid for it. So there's no getting extra money from people. App updates are free. Um, and then, yeah, there's, there's going to be costs. So not even just like say you're the time that you 
spend on it. So I, I actually have several friends who have full-time job, but also have side side gigs. And, you know, they all, all of them that have subscription, use subscription to offer a way to compensate them for their work, uh, kind of as an alternative to ads, you know, kind of cite, well, there's more than just kind of writing. So like, yeah, there's the time that you spend writing an app, but if you are an app that needs like storage, like AWS, that you, you need some kind of like server support, like maybe, you know, you do some kind of cloud syncing, maybe you kind of tap some other API, that's, that's going to cost something. And that's a recurring cost. And that's a very common recurring costs, you know, like a flashlight app or a I always think of fart apps because I feel like it was like the first apps I heard about. Yeah, you know, I forgot about fart apps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like kind of going back to the old days, like things like that are yeah. self-contained, will not have these recurring costs. So sure, you could say, um, I spent this amount of money in my life. It probably won't need updates, maybe. So I can charge this flat rate. But if you are kind of any kind of app that needs to compete with things that are increasingly interconnected, that are increasingly cloud-backed, it, it's really hard to not have these recurring costs. Like for anyway, sorry. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, I I could go on for this forever. Please continue. Well, yeah. And, and you're totally, and you're totally on the right <laughs> track. And like, and like, and you know, he singled me out. I don't know what he's referring to that I referenced or whatnot, but the thing is, is that like, not to go back to Apple bashing, but like, Apple in the creation of iOS and the iPhone and the app store uh, ecosystem basically devalued the price mm -hmm. of apps for all developers. And then that, that eked over into Android when Android launch had happened. So you tell me how many, if you see an app in the Google play store, that's 48, 48 99, are you going to buy it? No, because nobody values no. the apps they're, they're, no. they're installing, right? right. Two ninety nine a month. Two ninety nine a month is a little more palatable, and you know, and if it's an app I use that I I consistently get feel that I have value and I'm okay, pay, you know, paying for it and doing it and stuff like that, then I'm fine paying the two ninety nine a month because I'm not going to pay fifty bucks the way we remember we used to. I used to spend seventy five dollars on computer games when they came out. Right. And mm -hmm. I play them and finish them and be done with it. And like the thing was software was a, and like, clearly you have 35 years of experience. You're a game developer. You know what I'm talking about. You would get a box with 10 discs and you would play that game and you'd fantastic. Yeah. And when you're done, you put it on the shelf. That's the software doesn't exist now. Software exists in the cloud there. When to your point that there are, uh, you know, infrastructure costs that are recurring ongoing costs. I have an app like th that I maintain and is part of my business and we provide it for free because we want users to do, but we've also created a piece of hardware that plugs into a cloud service and we charge a monthly subscription or yearly Absolutely, subscription yeah. because, because, because guess what? The more you use it, the more it, it the, those charges exist for us. We have to cover our costs somehow. Right. And so I, I don't know. I just don't think it's, I, 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 I get the, the idea of charge something for for your your software, I totally get that. And if I'm buying, you know, like you know, but but I was just gonna say, if I'm buying Photoshop, then I get spending five hundred dollars for a great piece of software that enables me to do so much more. But even Adobe moved to subscription yep. service. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah. I, you know, I don't know, man. I don't know. I like, I I get I get the argument, but I think it's outdated. I think that I think that society and everything has moved on, and also the app app infrastructure marketplace is so devalued. Um, you know, and I just did a quick search for expensive Android apps and there's an Android here. I'll put it in the, in the chat. There's an Android authority article that, um, lays out the 10 most expensive Android apps and games, but you know, it's things like Creston, which is the smart home system. If you're, if you're familiar with smart homes and stuff like that, Creston, the whole system could, you know, that says here could cost up to $10,000. The app costs $99 to use. Like that's insane. Right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, direct TV's app is, is, you know, c you know, could be up to $129 a month. Right. Um, you for, know, for, for direct app, TV. You, yeah. Right. But for, yeah. for the service. Yeah. But then here you yeah, see Dr. Service. Web security space life, you know, antivirus app that they're charging for $89. Right. Like, so some people are doing it, they're offering it, how successful they are, who knows, but right. like. I know for me, the market I'm looking decides that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, like I, I'm, 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 I have a harder time swallowing any sort of app, whether one-time purchase or subscription that is more than seven to 10 bucks, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that's just mm -hmm. the fact of it. So, yeah. yeah. And I think Another something about, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go. No. And I, I think something, especially with subscription, I think, you know, especially, and as I mentioned these days, it's really hard to get your foot in the door. Um, in, into into being being a successful, you know, app developer, mm -hmm. especially if you're small and independent. Big companies, yeah, like 
it's kind of par for the course. Most of them are free anyway, because as you mentioned, Ron, they have other in- income streams that are offsetting this cost. So that makes sense, you know, and they, yeah. and they can charge like a small fixed rate. Um, with subscriptions and I, you know, as I get old, like I'm annoyed at subscriptions too. Sometimes they're a pain in the butt. Sometimes they are kind of, I wouldn't say predatory, but just kind of, you know, they're very, they're they're very sticky at times. And it's hard to have like some, a lot of places don't have trials where you can kind of test something out. But at the same time, I think a subscription is a good compromise in, okay, you, you, maybe I see an app that I might like it's $9. I download it. I don't like it. And and yet to some extent you do have kind of like re- return periods and things like that, but maybe ultimately that $9, if I use it for like a month and a half, wasn't worth it. But with a subscription, I can always stop and start again when I please. I know that's overly simplifying it because it's a lot more of a pain in the butt than that. But I do think it's, it's a way of people being able to compete with other apps that are either free or as you said, low priced rightly or wrongly. Um, i sometimes think the latter. Um, and that gives, still gives people freedom and like kind of, uh, you know, it, it, the right to say, okay, I will continue, you you continue to bring value. So I'll continue to give value to you or give you compensation for that as well. And I, I, I know that they're annoying, but especially if they're kind of like earnest, if they're priced well and, and that you're not, and they don't, ex, you know, you don't ask a user to call you <laughs> to cancel your subscription or something. Yeah, right, right. Like that. I think it's an option. And I think it's an option that is one of the only ones that that people might find viable might might find like palatable for their users and for their consumers. So I think it's a tool for their business. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I so, can't, I can't continue doing what I'm doing if I'm not making this this money to support the infrastructure to support my time. Whatever. One that one of the things that kind of came to to my mind is you know even for the indie developers like the one person team let's say that might create an app you know and you might say well it's just one person like what what do they have to support you know with a with 299 or whatever it kind of reminds me of like the patreon model right like in in many yeah. other avenues we find someone who we think is creating good music or creating good YouTube content or whatever. And we find value in that enough to say, Hey, I like what you're doing. So, you know, maybe in this case, you don't necessarily need to pay for the app. Maybe, maybe in this case, you're just supporting, well, I mean, going back to the, the mantra, right? Supporting your dev. You're saying yeah. this is a dev who's creating really great work. And I want to reward this dev for that great work. And I'm willing to give this dev $2 a month uh, just because I think what they're doing is really cool. And maybe it's just, maybe it's a mind shift, uh, mindset shift. At the same time, there are people who will never, who will, you know, they're going to be kicking and screaming to the idea of paying more in, in monthly subscriptions. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Can't please everybody. Yeah. And like, I don't see how you can say, you're not you're anti a revenue stream to support devs like i just don't see how you can say it like like you know like i I believe that good work should be compensated in whichever format the developer or the business or whatever decides to given the confines of the marketplace and right now the marketplace is the app store ecosystem and that's how it works so yeah 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 Yeah. i mean I'm biased. I'm I'm a dev and I like to eat, but I, I don't mean to simplify it or or kind of be so flippant about it. But I mean, it should eat. It's it. I should eat. I, it, yeah. it's good. It's, it, and it's true. And I, I just like to also emphasize, especially for mobile in, in particular, and talking about apps in particular. Um, I, I know again, we gave, we gave some very simple examples, but there's always going to be a chance that you know, especially especially the the industry and the tech sphere that mobile is, everything moves forward. Certainly you're going to have people that use the same phone for like eight years if they can. But in general, I think I think the average is that people are going to update their phones two to three to four years. Google is going to update your, update your OS, whether you like it or not. And yep. I think as a dev, there is some, res- I, I do feel personally uh, some, ethical responsibility to build software that works, that serves the people that are like, you know, if they're paying me or just in general, I, I have an ethical responsibility to do my best job to, to write something that serves people, especially if they're paying me for it. Now there's a conflict there that if you pay me once and, you know, say that we kind of come to a net zero where I felt like you've paid me what I, you know, deserved to do that initial like um, implementation. And what happens in like five years when, you know, and this has happened, Android oh, yeah. pushes some kind of breaking OS change or some kind of security um, incident happens and you have to kind of update some protocol in your in your application. 
what, what do I need to, do? What, what can I do then? What if it takes me like a month, two months to fix that? What if it takes me, you know, requ- like licensing something or, or having to switch something out and you've already kind of paid me what we've agreed initially that you, you know, like, you know, owed me, I guess. Um, it, it's never going to be as simple as like, okay, a one and done. There's always going to be something more, especially totally. if you want your app to, especially if it's an app that continues to provide value and you want it to continue, continue to be uh, valuable, to be useful, to be up to date, to be safe uh, security wise, it's just going to incur costs. And like, so I know subscriptions suck, but sometimes, especially for again, <laughs> small and independent developers, it's kind of the best way to kind of continue um, incentiv- incentivizing sounds a little bit cold, but yeah, just allowing people to keep doing these things. Like I, I think a lot of us enjoy what we do, but we need to eat and we need to kind of like, you know, make up for this time or pay for like the server band, whatever right. like story. Cover all server the costs, yeah. we, need, we need to cover costs. Like yeah. I would love it if I could just make my apps for free and then have someone else put the bill for like all these other kind of like um, coral auxiliary uh, accompanying costs. I really would. Um, but it yeah. doesn't work like that. So yeah. Mm. It's not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. See, Brett, thank you for uh, sending in your email. Uh, as rantastic as it was, the email of the week. Uh, but what I'm an email of the week. What a yeah. first email of the week for him. Well, I'm so, I'm so <laughs> yeah, exactly. Welcome. <laughs> I, I, talk I thought about I was hazing. like, ooh, dang. Right? Here we go. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, like you said b- before the show, right out of the frying pan into the fire. Oh, yeah. yeah. A nice, yeah, easy, so. chill one to start. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> yeah, no big right. deal. Just hit it out of the park you know listen there will be there will be fun you know lighthearted <laughs> ones to come i promise you so. <laughs> indeed indeed but that was that was a really great conversation <laughs> uh we have reached the end of this episode always a lot of fun to do this and even more fun now because we have a new member of the family when Awesome having you on board. Thank you so much for hopping on tonight and going forward. I should I should mention that you're actually not going to be on the show next week. We realize you're starting, but you're not going to be on the show next week because can can I say it? Yes, you can I'm, say it. It's your birthday. It's, my it's birthday. your birthday. It's like, like exactly my birthday. My birthday is the 18th. So I was like, Chase, I can I can do the 11th. But, but can I not do the next week? <laughs> not that I wouldn't want to spend my birthday with all y'all, but um, I'll probably like take time off and you know spend time with my husband. Um, but yeah, yeah no, yeah. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been a long time fan of the show. And so again, this is all just wonderfully full circle. And I, I love I, I love Android, uh, diving it and talking about it and using it. So this is just, this is aces. So. Right on. Well, yeah. thank you. You fit right in. It's so great to have you here. Um, if people want to, you know, yeah, this is your opportunity to basically tease or, or promote anything that you happen to have going on. So go for it. Yeah. So I am an Android developer. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Queen Code Monkey. My apologies for like a really long uh, handle. And my kind of website is randomlytyping.com. I promise, promise that I do actually generate quite a bit of content uh, about kind of like dev life, uh, different things that kind of I'm doing and other people that I know are doing. So please stay tuned. I swear there's going to be stuff there. (laughs) Right on. Thank you again, Wen. Uh, And happy birthday in advance. Oh, thank you. Ron, what about you? What you got? I am a huge supporter of taking your birthday off. You should not not lift yeah. a finger on your birthday and just indulge in celebration Agreed. of life. So definitely Agreed. enjoy. Um, but yeah, not much. Just follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at RonXO um, and go check out Scorbit in the Google Play Store for free. Uh, mind you, a free app to, to uh, if you like pinball, you definitely want to check out Scorbit and check out everything we have at scorebit.io. Um, and yeah, just be good to one another. And listen, don't discriminate on uh, on chat bubble color. So that's the message. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. Thank you, Ron. Uh, big thanks to Burke at the studio uh, for doing everything to bring you this show live and in real time and switching the show and all that. Also, big thanks to Victor behind the scenes for taking that recording that Burke made and turning it into a podcast so you can listen to it and watch it at your leisure. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Jason Howell. Uh, you know, I also do a show with Micah Sargent here on the Twit Network, twit.tv slash TNW. That's Tech News Weekly. We do lots of fun interviews there so we got something uh in the works for this thursday and club twit 
That's the other thing, twit.tv slash club twit. That's our ad-free subscription tier. So if you want to get all our shows, but you want to get them with no ads in them, and that includes this ad that I'm reading right now, uh, then that's what you need, Club Twit. It, you can get it at twit, uh, twit.tv slash Club Twit. You'll also get an access to an exclusive Twit Plus podcast feed. Ant Pruitt is killing it, man. He's he's doing all sorts of uh, unique, uh, special content that only uh, Club Twit members have access to. So there's some extra incentives there. And then you also get access to a members-only Discord. Seven bucks per month. You also happen to be helping out the company. We really appreciate it. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. That is it for this week's episode of All About Android. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, we do this show every uh, Tuesday uh, evening. Twit.tv slash AAA is the show page on the web. That's where you can go to subscribe to this show. And uh, then you don't have to worry about seeking it out. It'll just appear on your device like magic. Uh, but that is it for this week. We'll see you next time on All About Android. Bye, everybody. Hey, you don't have to wait till the weekend to get the tech news you need. Join Jason Howell and myself, Micah Sargent, for Tech News Weekly, where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news.